Good evening. Welcome to the Frontline Club. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. Those of you at the back, there are still a few seats scattered here and there. If you want to come, come and take them. Down there. Um, so, um, thank you very much for coming. Kate Brooks is going to be giving a talk tonight. Um, if I can remind you, please, to switch off your mobile phones. And when we get to the Q&A, if you can speak directly into the microphone for the benefit of our online audience, that'd be great. Uh, I'm just going to pass over to Ramita Navai, who's moderating tonight's talk. And she is a, a journalist for Unreported World on Channel 4. She knows Kate well, so she'll introduce tonight. Thanks. Yeah, well, Kate is an old friend of mine. And we first met in 2004 um, in Iran. And I was working in Iran, and Kate came out for a job. And of course, I went straight onto Google and Googled her, check out the competition. And um, I realized really quickly that your photos were so familiar. I'd seen them before. And Kate's photos are so iconic that you remember them instantly. But we didn't really bond until a few years later, when quite unexpectedly, Kate uh, <coughs> phoned me up out of the blue and said, I've got your job. Um, and she was going to be working in northern Iraq, photographing refugees for the UN. And the UN said that they also wanted somebody to film interviews with the refugees. And Kate said, I know exactly the person who's going to do this for you. And it was me, even though professionally I had never lifted a camera in my life. Um, and, <laughs> and it did take me for about 30 minutes to work out where the earphone plug was. Um, but I got to see Kate working at really close quarters, and two things really struck me. The first, that she works with real integrity. Kate really cares for all her subjects and for all the situations that she photographs. And you can, you can really see this in the book. Um, and actually, for years, Kate tried to secure funding, find money for, for children um, in a Russian orphanage after she photographed them when you were really young then, weren't you? How old? Uh, that's, I mean, that's when I started working as a yeah. photographer. So I started that project when I was 19 and started working professionally when I was 20. So I was a student actually in England at the time and going back and forth um, to Russia. And that, yeah, that was the, the start of my photographic career. Yeah, so Kate, she doesn't just shoot and go. She doesn't let the story go. It really gets under her skin. And the second thing that really came across was that when she worked, she was almost invisible. She had a really non-invasive presence. People are really comfortable in her presence, which means that really quickly and really easily, she gets very intimate photos, which is especially hard in the countries where Kate works, where communities are so closed. And it's especially hard to photograph women. Um, and also, I noticed that uh, people, she's the kind of person, there are those people in life that you feel that you want to tell everything to, which is so important for a journalist. And I noticed that people felt really comfortable really exposing themselves to her. And that's, I mean, that's a real gift when you're working. And she'd work really quickly, she'd be in and out, and people would really, really take her in. And she's, I mean, you've made so many firm friends along the way that uh, I can't keep up with all the names and all the countries of people that she's still in touch with from just having worked in places once. Um, I'm going to shut up, and I'm going to let Kate and the pictures do the talking. <laughs> oh, well, I'm very, very flattered by that introduction. <laughs> um, so I just came up with a book um, called In the Light of Darkness and uh, last month, and it's basically a collection of photographs spanning um, the last decade from the beginning of the war in Afghanistan through to the beginning of the Arab Spring. Um, I was initially sent out to Pakistan. It was supposed to be for a four-day assignment uh, with Pete Norman, who's somewhere in the room, and ended up staying 10 years. So I think this idea that stories get under my skin is really true. I mean, at, right after Pete and I arrived in Pakistan, the U.S. started bombing Afghanistan. and. Um, it was literally two days later, and I think within a week I was already starting to look for a house because I decided I was going to move to Pakistan because I wanted to be closer to the war. Um, 
And so I'm just going to go through some of my photographs from the last 10 years and, and particularly um, well, and start with the, the first photographs that I took um, in Afghanistan. And I'm just wondering if we can dim down the lights. Awesome. So I was in Pakistan for about uh, two months before I ever went into Afghanistan. I mean, I really wanted to be in Afghanistan when the airstrikes were first beginning, but I was, you know, I was 23, and even though I'd been working as a professional photographer for three years, I was totally ill-equipped. And, you know, this war um, was, you know, marked a point, um, a changing point in our industry because it really was when people switched from analog to digital photography. And at the time, when I went off to Pakistan, I didn't have a digital camera, so I was shooting film, processing film, scanning film, um, and I knew that going into Afghanistan like that um, was, you know, I wouldn't be able to produce and compete professionally. So it was all about waiting for my moment. And after being in Pakistan for a couple of months doing various assignments, um, I decided to go to Jalalabad in eastern Afghanistan, which is uh, the capital of Nangarhar province. And, and that's where uh, the Tor mountains of Tora Bora are, where Osama was hiding. And so I, I heard, that, you know, there were rumors that Osama was in the mountains of Tora Bora, and I decided um, to go there and organize the convoy with a bunch of other journalists and went um, on my own. Um, I would like you to share this story with everyone. For those who haven't read the book, Kate is convinced that she saw Osama twice, <laughs> not once, but twice. <laughs> you have to explain. Okay. Um, <laughs> So right after I got there, actually, there was, you know, the time in Pakistan was sort of well spent because I was sort of mixing with uh, warlords who were sort of planning to go back to Afghanistan. And I met someone, a guy named Haji Zaman, who was a warlord, and he was sort of heading the Eastern Alliance. And, um, and so as soon as I got to Jalalabad, uh, there, I literally, I mean, I dropped my bags at the hotel, went to see this man, Haji Zaman, with this other journalist that I had met while Haji Zaman had been giving a press conference in Peshawar. And, um, and he confirmed that Osama was in the mountains of Tora Bora. And, um, and we went back to the hotel like an hour and a half after getting to Jalalabad. And Pierre put the story out on the, the uh, wire services and created a complete frenzy in the hotel. Um, and within a day or two, we were in the mountains of Torbora, um, photographing the the bombing and um, and everything that was happening in the region. Um, this was one of the first civilian casualties that I photographed um, in Afghanistan. And you know, one of the things that's like I I think it's a sort of uh, an important important point is that. You know, until 2006, nobody was keeping any records or doing any documentation of civilian casualties in Iraq so, or in Afghanistan. So there's actually uh, no way to know what the civilian toll has been um, over the last 10 years. But this was a child who had, um, you know, who had been a healthy child and lost his eyesight and one arm and a hand um, in a bombing. These are, these are the Afghans who were helping. Um, they were basically fighting the, the ground war. And you know, at that time, there basically were not American troops other than some special forces on the ground. It was an air campaign, and these were the Afghans that they were coordinating with to capture Osama. And this is a you know, photograph that everybody loves it. It was a picture of, um, it's a picture of Pakistani jihadis. They had come to Afghanistan to basically kill <coughs> American soldiers, except they couldn't find any. And <laughs> it is kind of funny, actually, but they, they got captured on the way back and then were released during uh, a Ramadan amnesty. And, um, you know, back, you know, it's interesting to reflect back. I mean, there were so few you know, American soldiers that they couldn't find any, but, you know, you talk about six months later and there were about 7,000 American troops um, in Afghanistan, and now it's 10 years later and there's 100,000. 
How, Kate, how has working in Afghanistan changed as a photo journalist over the last 10 years? Well, I mean, back in these days, you know, I could move around. Um, you know, I think, I mean, Tor Bor is a little bit of a different scenario, but even then, I, I mean, I literally drove from the Pakistan border through the Khyber Pass. Um, you needed something called an NOC, so it's like a government uh, permit to go through that area. You hit the Afghan border, drive over the Afghan border an hour and a half. You know, it wasn't safe then. There was a, a number of journalists were executed on the road from Jalalabad to Kabul about uh, a week and a half or two weeks before um, I went in. So there was sort of lurking danger, but at the same time you could move around the country. And, um, you know, I feel quite lucky and privileged to have started working in Afghanistan when I did because those first um, few, the first couple of years in Afghanistan, 2002 and three, there was really a great sense of hope. Um, and, and it was possible to travel around the country to parts of the country that had been closed off for, for many years, if not decades. And, you know, now basically you, um, you can, you know, it's difficult to travel by vehicle outside of Kabul you know, whereby I used to have to search for signs of the war. Um, now there are suicide bombings in Kabul all the time. So it's a totally different uh, atmosphere. And this picture was of, um, it, it's of a, a child that was born prematurely and, and died. And one of the things that like struck me most when I first started working in Afghanistan was the poverty in the country. At the time, this picture was taken in Kabul. At the time there was, one incubator in the main hospital. So this, this child was a twin. The, the twin stayed in the hospital in the incubator for a few days and when it eventually got pushed out of the incubator because there was overcrowding in the incubator, the mother brought the, the other child home, kept it under a blanket by a wooden stove for many days and the other child passed away as well. Um, and This is a female, Afghan fem uh, parachutist who had uh, jumped out of an airplane about 500 times before the Taliban. You really liked her, didn't you? Didn't you think she was quite kick ass? She's, she's really cool. <laughs> this was the first public sporting match um, after the fall of the Taliban. So. You know, and this was the stadium, it was an Olympic stadium, so it was a stadium where the Taliban carried out executions. And it was uh, uh, oversold, so there was a bit of a riot um, outside of the stadium. Um, but it's a it was a very exciting time to be in Afghanistan where people were really sort of testing uh, the limits of freedom and regaining a sense of personal freedom and, um, you know, I think individual identity after years of oppression. Uh, these guys um, <laughs> were, uh, this, was, this picture was taken, I mean, going back to how things have changed, this mm -hmm. picture was taken in the spring of 2002, and um, it was about, you know, a 10 to 14 hour drive from Kabul. Basically, I mean, there was no visible Pakistan-Afghan border. There was no border monitoring. People just sort of meandered back and forth. Um, and these guys were considered to be gray forces, which meant that they work for, they were working with the coalition forces. They were also working with um, Al-Qaeda, with Taliban. And there's a cave complex there that was bigger than um, the one in Tora Bora. And so I thought it was a good idea to go there. My favorite is the one-legged flautist. This, this, I mean, it's quite a strange picture because this, 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 this picture was taken outside of a shrine to a number of uh, Taliban who were killed um, in a bombing on a mosque in the first few days of Ramadan. So it was in November of 2001. And so the, the guys who were killed in the mosque bombing were considered to be martyrs by many people, and uh, this flute player was playing outside of the, the shrine to the martyrs. Um, 
You know, I kept hearing reports about all of these like starving prisoners in, in northern Afghanistan um, and I decided you have to, to get there you have to go through this area of Afghanistan, you have to go through the Selang Pass which is very difficult to cross particularly in the winter and, and back in those days because um, there are regularly avalanches, there's tunnels where um, people sometimes die from car fumes and I kept putting off, I had lots of colleagues who were going to mazar sharif all the time and I just kept hearing about their, these hellish trips and so I kept putting it off. But when, when I heard about this story I decided you know, it was worth making the trip. And basically <coughs> you had um, you know, a few thousand captured Taliban fighters who were taken to this prison um, in northern Afghanistan. And, um, and there were reports about several hundred of them starving to death. And so I basically drove there to find out if it was true and to photograph the prisoners being held. The, these sets of photos here of the prisoners, is it true that um, they weren't published? Oh, was it on live before? Yeah, I was wondering that. I couldn't tell from here. It's a little bit funny. I'm sorry. Um, they weren't published. Yeah, I couldn't get anybody to publish these pictures. I mean, yeah, the like story hadn't come out. There was like a huge. Well, you know, actually, in some British papers, there were reports about these these um, these starving Taliban prisoners, but I couldn't get anybody. Had anyone to got the photos? Uh, I. I don't remember seeing photos. I don't think they had. And I couldn't get I couldn't get any American publication to touch them. You News think that was political? Well, I think it was, you know, at a time when um, Americans were feeling, you know, exceptionally patriotic because mm. it was so close to right after, you know, the nine eleven attacks. I think that was part of it. Newsweek, however, did do a story about because what had happened, these guys were captured in um, two different parts of northern Afghanistan and they were transferred to this prison and in the process of being transferred several hundred if not thousands are supposedly said to have suffocated to death in these transportation containers. Mm -hmm. The ones that survived ended up in this prison. Um, so Newsweek did a cover story about the, the massacre and an investigation into the massacre but then didn't touch the issue of the starving prisoners. And I, I focused on the starving prisoners because I couldn't photograph the aftermath of the, the massacre. Mm -hmm. Is it not working? It's not working. <laughs> he wants to stick around. Hold on a second. Where's Flora? We seem to have froze. Okay, let's see that. Oh, more. You can actually see these, how they were supposed to have looked very quickly. So it's just, you know, I mean, as much as, um, you know, over the last 10 years I've, I've photographed a lot of conflict or actual, like, you know, fighting and sort of, you know, the, the gore and horror of war. but. For me, I think the thing that's always been more interesting is more about how it affects, how war and conflict affects societies and how people live um, around war. And these were, I photographed these boys, it was actually, you know, I was in Kabul for the first couple of suicide bombings. So this would have been actually shortly after we met in the winter of 2004. Mm -hmm. And um, I was on the way back from the second suicide bombing in Kabul. And these three boys, they're two brothers and their cousin, and they are sort of working as roadside mechanics. Um, their father had lost his leg during the Civil War, so they were basically 
helping provide for the family. The photograph um, of an Afghan a parliamentary candidate in 2005. You know, last, last week you know, marked the 10-year anniversary of the war. I was actually here at the club last week. There was a big debate about you know, whether the war has been good, what the outcome of the war has been, what does it mean, and, um, and you know, undoubtedly Afghan women's roles and rights have um, greatly um, improved. I mean, a woman running for parliament and being in public office 10 years ago was absolutely unthinkable. These are women um, perform preparing to perform Shakespeare. It was a, Af a Dari adaptation of a Shakespeare play in Kabul um, for the first time. I guess it was the first time since 1979 that Shakespeare was performed in Afghanistan. It was, it was a really nice moment. There were public performances and, um, and these women, you know, were, this is before their performance. I mean, they were just ecstatic to be performing. And these are, these are women um, waiting to vote in Nangarhar, so the same province that the bombing of Tora Bora happened in, in a very sort of rural community. And I was in the, at this local polling station. Um, the, the men, the policemen in the polling station um, didn't want me to take photographs, but I had the press card that was needed to be able to photograph in polling stations. And so, you know, we had a bit of an argument because I was basically saying I thought the women could decide for themselves whether or not they wanted to be photographed, given that they were voting. And um, they didn't really like my point, but actually the women supported me and had absolutely no problems with me photographing them. And I've seen you argue with people and it's pretty scary. <laughs> and this is, this is actually, um, I'm just trying to think about the time frame. This is a couple of weeks later. I mean, one of the things about going just back, you know, when I was working on this story, so, uh, you know, I was, it wasn't this candidate. I followed a couple of candidates, and one of the women who was there said, you know, she was really worried about the Taliban coming back, and I was saying, well, you know, I really, the war, I think it will stay to the south and the east, and, um, and it was a very, it was a strange time um, covering Afghanistan because, you know, Iraq was really eclipsing Afghanistan in terms of news coverage, and all of the positive things that were happening in Afghanistan uh, were kind of overshadowing signs of the creeping war. And so there was a reporter who I have worked with for many years for Time Magazine, and he wanted to do a story basically about the forgotten war. And um, Time Magazine didn't even know if they wanted to assign a photographer, if it was worth the, the, the expenditure to, to send a photographer. Um, and I was really keen to do it, but, you know, it was sort of, we, to being debated for, for weeks, and um, I was supposed to fly out the, the morning that I left for the embed, and they confirmed it at 3 o'clock in the morning. My flight was at 6 a.m., and I decided that I would do the embed, and so we went off to do this embed, and within, um, within the first 45 minutes, our vehicle got, or the, our convoy got ambushed and was hit by an ID. And it was the beginning of like a very long few days. We, you know, the, the soldiers I was with um, expected that we would be sent back to the base after the attack, but we, but we weren't. Um, we sort of went to a field um, and waited to be airlifted and then were taken to the top of a mountain for, for three days. Um, and we didn't have food supplies, we didn't have water. Um, and in the end, you know, they were basically supplies were being dropped to us from body bags. Um, and this is one of the soldiers who had, um, who was in the convoy that got hit by the ID. What happened to him? Um, this was, you know, I mean, in terms of, I was embedded with these guys for this period of time. So in terms of what's happened to him today, I have no idea. And looking through the photos of Afghanistan, you can see that you worked freely and obviously you've been on embeds. Do you think it's really important to cover both, to have a full picture? Is, does one provide more value than the other? Do you have preferences? 
Uh, you know, I, th I mean, I think in the, like, uh, the early years of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, people were very critical of like embedded journalists. And I, I've never really shared that view because I feel like it's just a different perspective. You, you know, you can document um, w what the soldiers are experiencing. You can document the combat that they're engaging in and also how they're engaging with the local population, which I think is really important, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a particular perspective. I think with Afghanistan, I've I've done maybe ten embeds in the past ten years. So I it's I've been more interested in sort of being on the ground with the local populations. But in the last couple of years, um, when I've been in Afghanistan, if I'm traveling outside of Kabul, it's usually in some form of an embed because of the fact that you can't really travel around the country um, at will anymore. And I think. I feel very lucky to have had, you know, by, to have both perspectives. Um, and this is a photograph of a, a child who was injured in a suicide bombing um, in 2006. I mean, now they're they're very, very, very frequent. <coughs> And um, this, uh, this is a photograph of Afghans playing soccer outside of the King's Palace. It's in Kabul. It was actually, you'd think maybe that this was an old photograph, but it was taken last October. Um, so it's one of my more recent photographs from Afghanistan. And um, is it, the palace was destroyed during the, the Civil War and the Afghan War. Um, but you, the cover of the photograph, which, which it, or the cover of the book, <laughs> is a photograph of um, you know, displaced Afghans who, recently displaced Afghans, who are living inside of the palace because they have nowhere else to go. The displaced from, from Helmand? Um, no, they were, they, they're Kuchis, and I cannot off the top of my mind remember which province they're from. So the nomads? Yeah. <coughs> So I, I basically went through Afghanistan, I mean, a selection from Afghanistan over the last 10 years. And the, but the book, I mean, the book ends up being, you know, sort of my travels through the region focusing on conflict. So, you know, even though I was working in countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran, um, they are not in the book because I decided it was going to be just looking at countries of conflict. Um, this is in, I covered the, the invasion of Iraq from Kurdistan for Time magazine. And um, this was the the first suicide bombing that I ever covered, um, it, and you know they became very very common. And I think you know this this particular bombing um, was, you know, I mean I'll I'll never forget it. It was basically for for a variety of reasons. I mean, first of all, I remember shortly before going into northern Iraq, reading a news report in um, a paper in Dubai. That we're in which um, it was about UN inspectors, and they were saying, you know, we haven't found signs of weapons of mass destruction, but actually we found lots of indications that Iraqi troops have extensive training in making IEDs. And also an article in which Saddam said, you know, if, if the U.S. invades Iraq, you'll see suicide bombings in the region like you've never seen before. So there was that. Um, on t in, in addition to that, I mean, on this, this was the first, you know, suicide bombing, and it also happened to be um, you know, a suicide bombing in which a colleague that I knew was killed, um, and I found his body at the scene of the attack. And, you know, in northern Iraq, there really, like, wasn't, at the time, um, you know, Turkey had basically said that the U.S. wasn't allowed to use the, the country um, for ground troops, uh, that American troops couldn't pass through Turkey. So the, the north wasn't really much of a staging ground for the invasion, but there was, um, there was like an Al Qaeda link group that was operating in the north, and, um, and so the... Um, when the war began, the, the U.S. began sort of going after um, this particular group that was close to the border um, of Iran.
What's the last picture? Um, these are, so basically, this is a Kurdish soldier who's going into the mountains to, um, to fight alongside U.S. Special Forces. Um, and they were basically in the, in the mountains um, executing these fleeing um, this, members of this group that were fleeing and calling in airstrikes. And I, I wasn't embedded. I mean, in this situation, I just kind of drove into it. And uh, they didn't really know what to do with me. <laughs> I just kind of said, OK, you're here. Um, these are these are Iraq, uh, Iraqi um, civilians who were living right along the the um, front lines of where you know prior to the invasion there was you know uh, Iraq was divided so they were living right along the no fly zone demarcation and so they basically when the war began they fled their homes because they were worried about. Republican guard re retaliating and um, and took shelter in these rocks. This is U.S. troops entering to Crete. Has become the cover of more than one book. It's been a cover of a couple of books. Yeah. Not my book. <laughs> um, in, in Iraq, there's this tradition of uh, marking. Um, things with bloody handprints as a way to sort of petition God for protection. So I, I, very close to the house that I was living in in Baghdad in 2003, there was um, a checkpoint killing. Basically, some soldiers were going after, they were, they were looking for Saddam. He was supposedly hiding in the neighborhood. Um, and there was a car full of civilians that didn't slow down quickly enough. And, um, and they shot up the car. A number of civilians were killed. Uh, a couple of days later, when I was walking with a coffin and the family through the street, um, I noticed this uh, generator that was marked with these bloody handprints. And basically, the corner shopkeeper had slaughtered a sheep and marked the uh, generator with his handprints after, the, after that incident. is um, a priest preparing for a baptism in Baghdad. Uh, this is after the uh, UN bombing in Baghdad, a family, an Iraqi Christian family who uh, lost a family member in it. And uh, this, is, um, this is in Najaf, you know, I think yeah, you know, I talk about it in my book. I mean, I have I have colleagues who sort of worked in um, Iraq for for years, and 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 they sort of talk about 2003 as being, you know, the good old days. And you know, when I think back about on them, I mean, I don't really remember anything good about them at all. Um, it was it was very it was dangerous then and it was pretty clear what was going to happen you know and there was the UN bombing um, a couple of weeks later there's this bombing at uh, one of the holiest sites um, in Islam in Najaf um, and it was a car bombing that killed 125-35 people. Oh, now when I asked you what image was imprinted in your mind that you couldn't get out you said this one yeah, I mean, this is picture, you know, it's, it's really hard to forget. I mean, the idea of, you know, having a, I mean, it's not even an idea. I mean, it happened. You have blood, you know, flowing through the streets um, outside of, you know, a holy mm -hmm. site. This one affected you. Well, I don't know what happened to him. You know, it was, um, I was in the hospital photographing him, and I got him medical care. He, the, the hospital was sort of overflowing with people um, who were, you know, in various states. A lot of people were dying, um, and he needed help, and I got him some medical attention. Um, and I went into another room, and I came back, and he was gone. And I don't know if he got moved to another room or if he died. So I, he's, you know, he's one of those people that you, I, I've always wondered, you know, what, what happened. Hmm. 
So I ended up moving. I, so I lived, I lived in Pakistan for about two and a half years, and then I moved to um, Beirut. I mean, the idea was to have um, a base in the Middle East from which I would cover a conflict that was, would be you know, somewhat stable. Um, and pretty much as soon as I moved there, um, you, the assassination of Rafi Kariri happened, which kicked off the Cedar Re Revolution. And then there was, um, you know, and basically assassination wars, because Rafi Kariri's um, assassination pretty much divided the country into, into two. It was basically those who were anti-Syria, anti-Hezbollah, and those that were pro-Hezbollah and pro-Syrian. Um, and this was a photograph of a, a Lebanese television broadcaster who um, was outspoken um, about her feelings about Syria's presence in Lebanon and influence. Um, and there was a car bomb that was placed under her car. She survived it. She lost an arm and a leg in the attack. Uh, this, uh, these are pictures of um, Beirut being bombed. It was the summer of 2006. Um, and I, you know, I had, was in New York. I was flying out of New York on the eve of this war beginning. And people were asking me when I was in New York, editors and friends and people I work with um, were saying, so what are you going to do this summer? I said, you know, I, I have no idea. I had nothing planned. Um, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll study Arabic this summer. By the time I got back to Beirut, um, this war has started, had started, and basically it started while I was in transatlantic flight. I missed my, my, my flight out of JFK had been delayed, so I missed my connection in Paris. And when I um, arrived in Paris, I read about these two Israeli soldiers who were captured on the border. Um, and when I got to Be back to Beirut, the, the war had begun, and, um, and it was basically, you know, go to the supermarket, stop, stock up on goods. But I would have never, I mean, I couldn't have imagined, you know, the week before that it was possible that during the time of a transatlantic flight that, uh, you know, a five-week war um, could begin in which basically, you know, the com country's infrastructure was completely destroyed and... Uh, you weren't an outsider at this point. So it, this is the first time that what was happening where you were living, because Beirut had become your hometown. Was it different covering it because of that? Uh, it was a totally different experience. I mean, I, it's one of the things I write about in the book, because in all these other conflicts, you know, I was sort of, in some way or another, there was always some sort of, um, you know, a place to look forward to returning, where with Beirut, mm -hmm. You know, I came home and suddenly the country that I live in is um, having bombs dropped on it. So, you know, I understood then what it really is to be a civilian caught in war. And while, you know, I could have left, I mean, leaving for me would have basically meant, um, the sa you know, in many ways, you know, the same thing that it means for, you know, what, for Lebanese. I mean, abandoning your home, life. your friends, you leave, leave with a suitcase, leave your pets behind, and, you know, and, and have no idea what's going to happen. And um, it's a very, you know, it's a very emotional experience. I had a lot of friends who left that way. My flatmate at the time um, left by boat and never, you know, never, didn't come back for two years. I mean, she, she never moved, she never lived in Lebanon again. And um, numerous friends, you know, it was sort of like saying goodbye by the, the uh, you know, on the Mediterranean shores. And, and these bombs were being dropped very close to my house as well. So it was also, you know, incredibly disturbing um, experience. You know, it was a few kilometers and, um, and just very, very loud. So, I mean, it was incredibly personal. It felt very personal. Yeah, and y you didn't stay just because of work. As you said, you had real emotional ties, didn't you? I remember you, at the time you were telling me, yeah, how could you live with yourself leaving your friends to live that way? Yeah, it was a different thing because I think with like Afghanistan and Iraq, I mean, I felt sort of compelled to cover these conflicts because, you know, because I'm an American photojournalist and, you know, my country's engaged in these wars. Um, and so, you know, with Lebanon, it was different. If I, if I didn't live in Lebanon, would have I covered the war in Lebanon? Um, probably not. It was because it had become a part of my life. 
um, and I started to understand and take more of an interest in the regional uh, dynamics and complexities um, of, you know, how one conflict um, influences another. This is one of my favorite photographs. It's um, two Lebanese soldiers at the um, site of uh, an Israeli air strike. Um, and one of the things about the war that summer was that the Lebanese army was instructed not to fight because if they had fought against Israel, then it would have been a war between Israel and Lebanon, where without them fighting, it technically stayed a war between um, Israel and Hezbollah. And this w they basically came to um, the site of an airstrike. There were 41 civilians killed in this airstrike. A lot of children were pulled out of the rubble um, the next day. And these men who had been trying to cordon off the area, it was sort of like a large stretch of men, you know, slowly sort of people moved away. And these two men were left there, um, you know, holding each other's hands. And to me, it really signified um, what it was to be in the Lebanese army that summer. This is some of the aftermath of that summer. And this is why you moved to Beirut. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a very fun place. <laughs> Great nightlife. Um, yeah, Lebanese kind of party as though every day is their last because they've actually, you know, lived with that for so many years. And so it actually, they're, in, they're, they're really sort of wonderful people. And um, if you want to have a party, that's where you should go. <laughs> This was later on. I mean, when it, so when it, you know, one of the after effects of uh, the war in in Lebanon was that all of these um, that Hezbollah left the government because they had government, they had uh, representation in parliament along with some other Shia ministers. So basically, the government collapsed. The country couldn't elect a new president for a year and a half, and at different points there were various strikes. Um, and this was after a day of uh, violent strikes in um, in in Beirut. And now we are in Egypt. Um, so I didn't go chronologically. I sort of worked through countries. So there's just a few pictures um, towards the end here um, of the Arab Spring. And this is um, in Egypt in January. Photograph of people praying in Tahrir Square. And Egyptians sleeping in front of um, Egyptian military tanks at a time when you know the military is basically still carrying out the orders of the government. So it was it was very difficult actually to take these pictures because every once in a while they would come off on their tanks and they would you know try to dissuade you from taking pictures and be a little bit threatening and then you'd sort of wander around and disappear for a little bit and then try to make your way back. And this is um, a photograph of uh, a Libyan rebel detaining some Africans who are trying to flee Libya. Um, I suspect they were workers, but they were sort of detained as being mercenaries. I was driving from Tobruk to Benghazi. It was right when I arrived um, with these guys being held up on the side of the road. I, actually, I remember us talking when you were in Libya, and there's a point where you turned back when you thought that it was too dangerous to operate. What, what is that point? What happened in Libya? Why didn't well, you stay on? Well, it's not this this photograph. Um, I did have a really hard time in Libya. I mean, I just I think in terms of like my own experience and and the way I've been sort of taught as a journalist was that you know you can take great risks, um, but there generally speaking, you know, you either, you're either following your intuition or you're making calculated risks. And in Libya, at least for me, it was sort of neither. You know, I ended up basically being in the Sahara Desert with everybody else who was there. 
um, and it was before there was any type of no-fly zone. So Qaddafi was dropping bombs on rebel positions. The rebels at that time had just, they were literally getting a day or two of training and then going off to fight. So there were a lot of, they were shooting each other all the time um, as well. These bombs were being dropped. It was total, complete and utter mayhem. And then there was no place to hide, there was no place to take cover because you're in the desert. Mm -hmm. It's just completely flat. Um, and everything about it felt wrong mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that, and I also, I had to leave because I had to finish the book. It was like really, I was pushing it. I mean, I was really quite frustrated that the Arab Spring um, happened just when I was <laughs> supposed to be there. finishing my book. <laughs> uh, and this is in Benghazi at the, um, yeah, the, the rebel opposition transitional whatever it's called government's headquarters in those early days when they're sort of making um, anti Qaddafi <laughs> posters and whatnot <laughs> and this was at a funeral um, one of many um, in those first few weeks of the war mm -hmm. Amazing. So that's the, a lot of the books that are, are a lot of the pictures that are in the book, but not all of them. I don't want to um, show everybody everything. Well, if anyone's read the book here and looking at those photos, your life is really chronicled throughout the book and your private life really intertwined with your work, um, how has this affected your private life? Well, has it been a problem? Well, I, would say, I mean, it's not like there's been a great, <laughs> there's not like there's been a great deal of separation. I mean, you know, I've basically been living on the story. So, you know, it's not as if I, like I was going to Afghanistan for two weeks and then going home to the U.S. I was basically going to Afghanistan for two weeks and then going home to Lebanon to cover war or, you know, going from going covering, you know, Iraq and then going back to Pakistan and covering <coughs> turmoil there. So I wouldn't say that there's, you know, a real world versus the life I've been living and, you know, I've forged amazing friendships in the field um, over the years and it's also sort of grounded a lot of my life there. No. Is it hard to come back to reality? How do you adjust? Well, that's one of the things. I mean, what, what really, what is, you know, what is reality? Because, you know, I think by, you know, being in the region and sort of bouncing from country to country for the last 10 years, I mean, I have a pretty good understanding of what the reality is like in the region for most people. Um, when I come back to the West, I mean, you know, it, it used to really strike me, the idea of like parallel universes and how is it possible, you know, that you could have, like in 2002, I mean, I was just blown away. I was like, I would go to New York for, th for three days. I was always rushing because I really didn't want to be out of Afghanistan for very long. But it's like, how could this world exist while well, this world exists? And I still have that a little bit when, when I'm in Dubai even. And, you know, I think, well, you know, Dubai and Afghanistan are so close. It's, it's really hard to understand um, on I think on an emotional level mm -hmm. how it is that people have such different realities when they are so close together. How do you get over everything that you see? I don't think you do. You know, I mean there's things you, like you never, there's just you know, things you never forget and people you always remember but you know, basically you know memory stayed. There's a bit in the book where you say one of your colleagues was always looking <coughs> for the fighting. Mm -hmm. um, how much of war photography is searching for the thrill, do you think? Is, is there that adrenaline that you get addicted to? Is, it, is there anything about it which is thrilling for you? Well, I think it's like an inevitable, inevitable byproduct. I personally, like I've never really been that interested in um, combat. Um, I, I don't feel like there's a great deal to learn from it. I mean, in a, I think Iraq's kind of a little bit of the exception where I'm focusing more on fighting 
and um, and maybe it was just because how much was going on or what you know what my assignments were but um, going back to your question which was um, yeah, I think, you know, this job and being in these situations, I mean, adrenaline is basically, um, you know, a human reaction. So inevitably, you know, it exists, but it's certainly, it's, it's not a motivation. Yeah, I mean, because you, you get all photographers who are there for the thrill of it. And, and I don't think most people, I mean, most people are at all. I mean, for you know, it's it really you have to really be. I'm struck by how much you're not deeply, you know, mm. I think committed to what you're doing yeah. because you're taking a lot of risks and making a lot of sacrifices. Has there been a moment that you feel has really defined you or changed you as a photographer? Mm. Um, I think you know the bombing in Najaf was certainly, I think, a, a bit of a, a marked a change. Um, How? Well, I think it was, you know, it was partially, um, I realized, you know, if I'm covering conflict, one, I need to, like, protect myself some psychologically. Like, I can be in conflict, but you really can't expose yourself to, um, like, atrocities all of the time because you are absorbing, you know, um, energy and you are having these experiences and, no, you don't really, your camera really doesn't protect you from being there. Um, and also feeling that covering, you know, life was um, more important than the, or just as important, you know, it depends, but than the carnage of war. Mm -hmm. And, you know, trying to bring people back to those people who are living, like these pictures of, you know, um, these children, for example, who live in this destroyed palace. Have you got any regrets? Um, not a great deal. Like, I think um, if I, with the clarity of hindsight, I would have moved around less. I, I moved internationally a number of times over the last 10 years. Um, Why? Because from moving around, we you well, a great body of work. I know, but it was like, you know, I lived in Pakistan, and I was in Pakistan, and I was covering Iraq, and so I'd leave Iraq after three months and go home to Pakistan, and I just felt like there was no way for me to sort of disconnect or have a break. So then I moved to Lebanon <laughs> and, and then I ended up moving to Turkey after that. So I would have I would have actually liked to have had more time in Pakistan and I would have liked to have more time in Lebanon um, because in spite of, you know, the realities that came with living in both places, they were two places that um, that I sort of loved in their own, you know, unique ways. Do you feel that you've given up some sense of stability um, for your job? Do you miss not laying down roots somewhere? Well, I never really had a chance to lay down roots. <laughs> I mean, I was 23 when I when 10 years ago. So, um, are you yeah. going to start? Maybe. <laughs> That's a no. <laughs> right. Well, anybody want to ask questions? Let's open it up. There must be somebody who wants to. <laughs> if you want to, I'm yeah. very happy to see you. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Um, it's, it's partly what one of the questions just asked. Um, oh. Sorry, that wasn't my fault. Um, it was my fault. I think you know this, Kate. But I mean, I mean, some of your photos uh, I find incredibly epic and beautiful, uh, including the ones in before your first photos from the orphanages. But I don't think one thing which came out is uh, like there was that photo of the woman in Bamiyan and then you with Tim in the east. Uh, I've never met anyone who, who, who moves, uh, that's an enormous amount of distance and Kate sort of would get, get in a car or a helicopter or plane and you really cover miles to take a photo. Uh, I do. And it, I'm just wondering what it is, it is partly that you know, you've moved around so much but it's, you're incredibly driven. I mean you, you think nothing of getting up and traveling a thousand miles for one photo. And until we <laughs> yes, at the pool at Latmosphere. Now that you mention that. <laughs> but what, what is that? What, and yet the photos have this real beautiful, you know, this stillness about them and that one in the, with the Pakistani jihadis. But I, it, it does seem something which I think 
is a little bit hard to get a handle on, but it, I mean, it's partly, that's not really a question, but I'm just wondering what is the motivation that's, it's just, I, I found it exhausting to keep that pace up, but you have some pace. I don't know, you did a pretty good job, Sean. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know, I guess it's, you know, somewhere, like, I deeply believe in the importance of, like, documenting um, history and, and, like, public record, and, um, and I, you know, and I do that with my camera, I mean, it is illogical. I, I mean, I kind of always say that I think photography is more, and photojournalism is more of a vocation than a job because it, it doesn't really make sense. Like, you go out, you're underpaid, you're overworked, you sacrifice a lot, you risk your life. I mean, it's a lot of people, I mean, like, you're, I mean, I know a lot of people say to me, like, you're crazy, why do you do this? And, you know, I think it is. It's just like a, a drive that you can't totally explain. Um, you still have it now, 10 years later? You know, it's hard. To say. It was really interesting. I mean, I had to. I had to stop because of the, um, the Arab, or because of the book, and it was during the Arab Spring. And I think I do, um, but it hasn't been tested in a bit because I've taken off a ton of time for the book. But going into, I would say, you know, going into Egypt. I mean, what happened to me going into Egypt was, and talking about how things have changed in Afghanistan over the last ten years. So I was in Kabul. I was doing a job for the New Yorker, a, a, a story about banking. Um, and I was seeing, you know, protests starting in Egypt, and there were also some protests happening at Be in Beirut at the time. And I had this like overwhelming sense, like I have to get on a plane, I have to get on a plane. And sometimes I really resist that. It's really sort of, you know, an intuitive sort of force, and um, and I kind of try to ignore it because I don't always want to do that. I mean, I kind of, you know, it's like the f amount of physical effort involved. And I told the editors at the New Yorker, look, I have to finish up this assignment and go because I feel like I need to be in Egypt. Um, so I was trying to finish this job for them and meeting up with a translator, flying out of Kabul a few hours later. And while I was meeting my translator at a supermarket in Kabul, just when I was pulling up, uh, there was a suicide bomber that detonated. Luckily, he was okay. And, you know, on my, I, w I mean, I was quite lucky too because I was just running late. But, um, when it came to getting to Egypt, you know, which took another three days uh, because flights from Egypt Air and all the rest of it, I mean, I was really, I think that experience in Kabul really shook me up because it was a translator as well that I'd worked with for almost nine years. So, um, you know, there was the moments when I was expecting to find him in a hundred pieces and, um, and that was very, very emotional. And, and trying then, you know, trying to get to Egypt. It's like, okay, the flights, the 3 a.m. flight is delayed for 12 hours, two days in a row, and then it's canceled. And flying into a situation that you really have no idea what's going to happen. Um, and I wasn't going with an assignment either, so keep this in mind. So I was really, like, struggling along the way. Like, you know, okay, what, where, where, I am I making a, a smart decision? I had people in my family who were saying, like, really angry with me for trying to go. And then, you know, I, I eventually got there. I ran into a friend at baggage claim and, um, you know, and got an assignment right after I landed. And, you know, I was, I'm, I'm really happy that I experienced some of that because it was also very exciting. It was so different. I mean, it was sort of a good moment to mark the, the end of the book almost too, because the story wasn't about Americans. It wasn't about Israel. It wasn't about Al Qaeda. It wasn't about the Taliban. It was like, it was like massive, you know, it was like this is one of the most historic things that um, is going to happen in the region for a very, very long time. Yep, this gentleman here. I am. Oh. Hi. <laughs> I am. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm getting a bit confused. <laughs> um, I've noticed there's some, uh, some really intimate photographs and uh, she explained before that it's due to the way you work when you're there, but especially the ones with the three, uh, three widows, but they uh, three women in black mm -hmm. crying, and uh, even the ones with the two uh, soldiers holding hands. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering how, in that situation, how uh, do you, <coughs> how do you get the people to actually understand the job you're doing there? Because uh, sometimes they can be can be quite complicated, quite delicate to um, allow somebody else to photograph you in such a um, sensi you know, sensible moment, mm -hmm. uh, how, 
how do you communicate that? And was that a language a problem at the time as well? Uh, well, I, I, st I speak a little bit of, I speak some Arabic and I speak a little bit of uh, Dari after being in Afghanistan for a number of years. But I usually have a translator with me. And um, it, it, really, it's, it really depends on like the situation and scenario. I could really be completely different. You know, um, you know I was in, in Libya, for example, at funerals. People were very aggressive and didn't want people photographing at the funerals. A lot of my experience has been that people want people to see, the, see what's happening. They want the world to see what's happening. Um, and in other cases, it's a matter of spending some time speaking with a person um, to explain a little bit about who you are and what you want and what your motivation is and to sort of try to form some trust. In the, in the, in the picture of the two soldiers holding hands, um, did, you, did you see this scene and then ask to photograph? But then I would expect them to react, okay, you can take a picture, but instantly they would leave the hands. Uh, was it something that you saw and then you asked to photograph, they took the hands off and then you asked them to put it again or how was... No, you, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't do yeah. that. I mean, hey, one, it goes against like journalism ethics, yeah. but also like the mom moment gets just wrong, you know, gets lost. I mean, generally, um, unless you're going into some sort of moment in somebody's home and um, you really have to get their permission. I mean, if you're in a public sphere and something is happening, like my, you shoot until somebody stops you. Uh, that's it. You know, like at the bombing in Najaf, I had people who were trying to attack me. And I had an Iraqi police officer. We had been in one place, and so I got a phone call about the bombing, and we drove there together. Um, he, he, he really, he, this man, you know, hadn't really liked me initially. He was trying to keep me in the women's section of the mosque. And after talking to me for like two hours, you know, he, um, he warmed up to me. And then he was saying, oh, you want a picture of Mukhtar al-Sadr? Okay, if you stay, you can get a picture when he's leaving. So I stayed, my colleague left, my colleague went off to this other mosque for Friday prayers. There was this explosion, I got a phone call. And that, by that point, the police officer had taken a liking to me because he, you know, has been hearing about my, that I've been working and living in Pakistan and in Afghanistan and they, I have some understanding of Islam and, um, and have respect for local culture. So he came along. And, you know, in the bombing, people were trying to attack me. And he basically stayed by my side. You know, he's flashing his um, the police badge to protect me and, to, and, and making me move really frequently um, so that, you know, I wouldn't be mobbed. Um, so, you know, there are, if you're going into somebody's home, you, you know, you have to, to ask. And I think, you know, I generally, if people really don't want to be photographed, I mean, I respect that. But if you're talking about something that's public and, um, you know, and particularly that's violent, I mean, my understanding is, you know, I guess in France, like, photographing on the streets is really difficult. But, uh, you know, in the U.S. generally, it's, if, if it's happening in public, then it's, it's, about, it's open to the public mm -hmm. observation and Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, sort of, sort of a follow-on question for the ladies, and I th you've sort of answered it partly as well. It was to do with the judgment of crowds. When you have a very emotional point, as in a suicide bombing or an airstrike, where the crowds, you say, might be very emotional, and they'll see you taking pictures, how, how long did it take you for, to judge when you could go in and take pictures and, and, and learn that basically this is a very dangerous moment and I have to leave? And how long did it take you to judge that I can go in and do that and I'll be okay? And what was the most dangerous in all those pictures you took when you had a moment like that? We said, no, I can't do this. I've got to, I've got to go quickly because I'm in danger now. I, mean, there's no, I wouldn't say there's any like hard and fast rule. Like with the, the Lebanese soldiers, I mean, the Israelis were bombing all the time. So they could have bombed while we were there. I mean, the whole thing was sort of tense. I was a little bit fixated on the photograph. Um, and so, you know, my sort of intuition about whether or not I should stay or go was kind of being influenced by the fact that I saw this moment happening and wanted to stay um, for it. And in other situations, you know, it's just a matter of experience, I suppose. Like, there's, there's a picture in the book, it's really, it's one of the more graphic pictures um, of the aftermath of a suicide bombing in Afghanistan. And, you know, while I was taking a photograph of the suicide bombing, somebody groped me um, and my, my translator 
got really angry and he was about to get in a fist fight and I just said, you know, let's just go because we're, we're, we're at the aftermath of a suicide bombing. Like, the crowd might turn on us. It's just not worth it. I, I don't really need to be here. So some of it, I guess, is judgment and some of, the, some of it's experience and some of it's just feeling. Yeah. Um, what advice would you have to give now to say your 23 year old self? My 23 year old self? Oh, God. Uh, maybe slow down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that, that's about it. Like, just slow down a little bit. Why? Would you have got, Why? Well, cause I would would you have got all of this if you'd slowed down? No, but, you know, well, a lot of it I could have because... That's what she wants to do, Yeah, right? no, I mean, I, I, like I was saying, I mean, I would have stayed in Pakistan a little bit longer and I would have stayed in Lebanon a bit longer because, honestly, in between there were two moves. And actually, like, I moved back to London. I tried that for a bit during those years. And the year I moved back to London in 2004, I spent the whole year in Pakistan and Afghanistan. All it was was very expensive. And um, because I was never here, and I, and you know, and then I, I had this very expensive apartment in London that I didn't spend any time in. Um, it just didn't make any sense, and it was, it was sort of fulfilling some emotional need, but totally impractical. And then when I left Lebanon and moved to Turkey, um, it was pretty much the same thing. I was in Lebanon for all the time after I moved to Turkey. So. I th uh, that's about it. I mean, I've made a lot of mistakes, I suppose, like along the way, but um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I made tons. No, I've made tons. Do but any stick out in particular? Um, to any stick out in particular? Um, I've, yeah, I mean. She's censoring at this point. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just thinking about it. I mean, you know, because it's not spe really specific things. I suppose, um, they, you know, it would have just. I mean, they weren't really, maybe they weren't really mistakes. Probably mistakes and not regrets. Yeah. No, and there are, you know what, it's an interesting thing. I mean, there are things that I regretted for a long time and then found out that things that I thought had happened didn't happen. Like I remember once, for example, there, I mean this is a small example, but it's kind of a good point where I had been asked to go to um, be on a panel discussion uh, with Jim Noctua in the U.S. and I didn't go. And you know, he's one of the photographers who really influenced me as a young photographer. And I didn't go to it and I regretted it for years. And then recently, I mean, literally like six months ago or a year ago, I found out that actually Jim never went to his own lecture. He canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there are, there are things that I thought were, you know, that, that were regrets. That I, so I think one thing is trying to live without regrets, actually, you know, and trying to be really uh, present in your life and in the moment that you're living. Have we given the microphone away because there's someone here. Hi. I think you're quite unusual in being a female conflict photographer. Do you think being a woman has actually allowed you to take photographs that your male colleagues couldn't have done? Um, I think it's helped a lot. I mean, certainly with the, you know, accessing women, of course. Um, I, there are men who've managed to take pictures of women in Afghanistan and other places, but it might be a better... Heathcliff, did you... Did you ever try to photograph women in Afghanistan? It's a lot tougher. Yeah. It's a lot tougher. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, I mean, it gives you an advantage just because you, you know, men and women are typically segregated. It's already, you know, taking a photograph of, of, of a woman or of people in Afghanistan, for example, um, in and of itself can be a challenge. So having somebody of the opposite gender uh, photograph you, or particularly a male photographing a woman, when a male and a woman shouldn't be alone and also the woman shouldn't be photographed, it just complicates the whole process quite a bit. What about the other way around? You mentioned earlier taking photographs of one of these warlords. Was that...? I, you know, it's, I, it's, um, it's a bit of a curious thing in the region. I mean, I found, I found it in Saudi Arabia and in Afghanistan. Um, and in Pakistan, I mean, generally, if you're, you know, if you're a Western woman, they don't, you're not really um, subjected to the same rules. So you're kind of seen as like this strange, uh, I don't Alien. know, almost like unisex, like, um, 
you know, treated, cared for a little bit like, you know, cared for like a woman and treated like an honorary man um, and are able to kind of transcend those issues. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you mentioned Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and I have two questions. First of all, uh, have you done any projects yet there? Second of all, if you are, if you didn't do, what is most interesting stories you might find there? Uh, I've worked in Saudi Arabia quite a bit, actually. I've been maybe six or seven times. Um, the stories have really varied quite a bit. I mean, I've done work on um, the Guantanamo Bay um, uh, detainee returnees. So the guys who were held at Guantanamo for six years and got sent back to Saudi Arabia. I photographed the wedding of one of them. Um, and then I've done stories about, I'm trying to think what the most recent did a story about women in Saudi Arabia. I've done a story about youth in Saudi Arabia. Um, was it difficult to approach Saudi women? I think it really depends on it, like in, in what capacity. But um, no, I mean, there are a lot of things like people don't really understand. I mean, people assume that, you know, all women, Saudi women are completely covered up. And in fact, in a lot of places, women in Saudi Arabia don't even cover their heads. Like, and... Um, you know, they wear the abaya, the sort of long black cloak, but they don't necessarily cover their heads. Um, so it depends, I think, on what you want to do and where you are. Photographing in Riyadh's a lot harder than Jeddah, for example, so it's also place specific. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you couldn't sell the pictures of the Taliban prisoners in 2002 or 2003. Uh-huh. Um, because of the political climate. I was wondering, what are the pictures you can't sell now? Um, I mean, there's nothing that, for, I can't think of anything that I felt so passionately about that hasn't been, I, that I haven't been able to get published. I mean, it was those pictures, because that's just one picture. I mean, I have dozens of pictures <coughs> of these guys who are in this p place, and some of them, I mean, it, are much worse. Um, so I found it, I, I, re I really found it hard to believe that uh, these pictures wouldn't be picked up or acknowledged by some publication. Um, but there's nothing in recent history that's really, um, that I've felt really, that I've taken, that I really feel that needs to be shown that hasn't gotten shown. Um, thank you very much for sight of some really powerful photos which I suspect a lot of movers and shakers really need to see from all parts of your presentation. Um, my question is um, based around uh, my own experiences and also the comments on Friday at the anniversary of 10 years in Afghanistan from um, General Stanley McChrystal, where he made a comment about the extreme lack of <coughs> cultural awareness at the time. Um, I know I worked for quite some time with many people who'd served in the Soviet army in Afghanistan, and I noticed two things. One was that their descriptions of combat were very similar to what we're hearing now, extremely similar, but also um, they seem to be rather more culturally aware of um, the situation in Afghanistan. Your experiences of contact with Westerners, either civilian and or military, over the years in Afghanistan, um, have you found that cultural awareness was as good as it should have been, and has it improved? Um, working outside Afghanistan, I've come across a number of examples of astonishing ignorance of the country people are working in. Uh, it's, it's changed quite a bit. I mean, the first picture, the first time I embedded in Afghanistan in 2002, you had, um, you know, men going into homes where, like, uh, you know, uh, American soldiers going into homes where there are Afghan women without female translators, but and you know it's improved over the years. But this is one of the last. I think it was the last embed I did. Um, yeah, it was about these FET teams. So it's female engagement teams. So the Marines basically hired all these Amer uh, women, female Marines, 
um, to go off and engage with the female population in Helmand. And so I went out with one of these like um, FET teams uh, deep into Helmand, and this was a year and a half ago, I guess. And um, and they didn't have a female translator. So on the one hand, it's like there was this cultural awareness, and on the other hand, when they would go to to people's homes and knock on their doors, either they would have to have a man from the home or re related family member do the translation, which means that none of the women actually talk about what they're seeing and observing and experiencing. Uh, or they would basically use their own male translator and try to talk to some people through a door. <laughs> It was, it was incredibly depressing because it was a, you know, it's a great, um, you know, the program was a great idea. And I think it worked better in some area, like parts of Helmand than it did in other parts of Helmand. But my experience of it was, you know, what a waste. And there were women, you know, American women who, um, there, I think there were some reservists who basically signed up because they really believed in this <coughs> program and got there and were just so completely disillusioned and disheartened. Um, it, but in general, I mean, there is a lot more cultural awareness. Typically, you don't find, um, you know, American soldiers now approaching, you know, Afghan women um, in a way that they would have 10 years ago. Or Hasn't it come ago. too late? But it was late. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it really, it the took a while. Been done. There was a lot of the damage that done. I get. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's definitely true like mm -hmm. that um, things that happened you know in the early stages of the war, the early years of the war largely shaped a lot of people's opinions about foreign troops be, um, because of their early interactions with them. I would like to ask a question about the photography really backing up what Sean Langan said about your work, which is deceptively simple and very stark, but goes straight to the point. I mean your pictures are quite electrifying, they, they don't pull any punches, and your commitment is evident in the imagery. <clears throat> what I'd like to know is, do you feel that photography is going to be enough for you next? I mean, your commitment is, as I say, um, self-evident, but where do you go from here? Is it enough to be taking photographs? Your writing in your book, and I've read it, really is equally not. interesting. So what's the next step? This is a message that needs to be conveyed. Have you been overhearing conversations that we've been having? <laughs> Uh, well, I worked on a documentary film last year um, as a cinematographer that is being released next month. Um, so I think I can imagine doing more documentary work, but I will continue doing spills. And um, there is a big question about what I'm going to photograph, you know, next. Um, Do you feel I, that still photography is going to be enough for you? Will be enough. I think if I'm doing some uh, documentary film work as well, or doing some writing to complement the photography, then yes. We look forward to it. Uh, I yeah. am. I've taken off. I mean, I've never gone this long without taking pictures since I was um, since I first picked up a camera when I was 16, going on 17. So like I don't know, 16, 17 years ago. It's been a really this year, I've I've been a, I've been very sort of disconnected to what's been like an extension of, you know, my heart and my eyes, my camera. It's it's not a part of my daily life anymore. So yeah, I'm really excited about getting back to taking pictures. Hi, um, thank you for sharing your thoughts and your image, images tonight. It's been really fascinating and you know, powerf very powerful images as other people have commented. I was just wondering, you know. This sort of last decade, the experiences you've had, I mean, has it affected your sort of outlook on on the world? And in a way, do you, do you see do you see things in, differently because of what you've been through? Do you feel that um, that the images that you take and the risks you take, do you think they're having the effect that you want? I mean, I, I, I mean, you, you seem to have a hell of a lot of compassion mm. for your subjects. I mean. I've met a lot of photographers over the years, and people do things for different reasons, and you seem to really care about what you're doing yeah. and the people you're photographing. I mean, it's so obvious, you know, especially listening to you tonight. And do you feel that what you're shooting, th does it have the effect that you want it to? Do you think that you're able to connect with the readers out there and sort of make a difference? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I think, like, being, um, you know, being in the middle of this, 
for so many years and not being spending much time in the West, particularly in the U.S., right? I mean, I left the U.S. 15 years ago. Um, this year has been interesting for me because I've spent a couple of months in the U.S., um, like maybe I've spent more time in the U.S. over the past year while I have been was in the process of putting this book together and, and the book coming out than I have in probably the last five years combined. And what struck me over a period of time, for example, is how important that picture on the front page of the New York Times is because, you know, the United States is so insular and also isolated, I mean, much more so than, you know, Europe. It's a totally different thing. And, um, and I feel like those photographs are so important to connecting people in the U.S. to what's happening to the outside world because most people have no... Um, connection to it otherwise except that unless it's in the form of you know I have a you know I might have a son or a brother who's fighting in one of these wars um, but beyond that they have no real experience of the people where these wars are being fought so I think that's really important um, and then you know I think with like the, the pictures where there's like more carnage like with the suicide bombings and we were talking about this the other night um, I did have, I mean, what, you know, how do you, you know, there's a part of my book, so I talk about, like, I had six pages in Time magazine after that bombing in Najaf, and all these colleagues of mine congratulating me, and I, I've never felt so unhappy, like, as a photographer, and, you know, how do you feel good about something like that, and I just don't think there is a way to feel good about it, you know, I mean, at best, like, and m maybe in this capacity I could, like, if, if some of the photographs I took of Carnage, stopped a potential suicide bomber from going off and detonating, then I would feel good about that. But like in and of itself, um, the, you know, it's, it, I think you know, being, covering those types of things is really sort of soul destroying no matter like how tough and committed you are. Um, did I ask you, answer your question? Um, I just w want to follow up from but, uh, what uh, Jocelyn's question was, which is um, 10 years is a pretty, numerically, is pretty arbitrary. Historically, I mean, it's pretty specific. Historically, it's very arbitrary. I mean, 10 years later, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't, what's going on in Afghanistan and Iraq, of the two places that yeah. you photograph, has nothing to do with, you know, uh, the number 10. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you feel that you'll continue to, to go back to these places um, as an American photographer, whether or not America is involved anymore. I mean, America pulls out of Iraq at the end of this year, 2014, out of Afghanistan. Do you think that you'll continue to go back and cover? Don't bet on that. Hmm? Don't bet on that. Yeah. Uh, with, I mean, with Afghanistan, yeah, because it's a, I mean, it's a country. I kept going back to Afghanistan because I totally fell in love with the country. Um, I, you know, I... I it's breathtakingly beautiful. Um, Afghans have, a, you know, incredible sense of humor. I've made um, so many sort of great friends there. I mean, it's a variety of things for me. So with Afghanistan, absolutely. And I think otherwise, you know, it's a matter of like what the story is, who I'm going to produce for, you know, and, and being clear about motivation. I mean, that's the only thing that I think that's really changed with time, too, is like when it comes to taking great risk, being very clear about what you're taking the risk for. And actually something I meant to, was going to say when Heathcliff asked me, I mean, I'm very, I am very weary of war now. And I'm one of the problems I had with in Libya on top of like the, the inherent risk in covering it was like, you know, the drumming, the call to war, and being very, very, very sort of weary about being a part of that after what happened in Iraq. Um, so that's changed. You know, I, I sort of look at everything a little bit, I'd, I'd say, much more skeptically. And it's not, I wasn't on board with, like, the invasion of Iraq at all. But, um, but I'm, I, I think, you know, I mean, sadly, I think the world's even a little, like, more cynical than I even thought back then. So, um, so, um, yeah, I'm careful. I think a little bit more careful about what I'm, you know, directly and indirectly supporting. One last question. Um, I was just wondering if what you've seen and, and kind of the work you've done has left any feelings for you to actually feel patriotic at all. 
And if it has, what, what America or what part of America you still connect to? Um, you know, I mean, I, it's funny, I wouldn't say that I'm not patriotic. I mean, I, I am. Um, I think that the U.S. has made huge mistakes. I think, like, the invasion of Iraq was just, you know, it's catastrophic um, in terms of what it, I mean, what it's meant for Iraq. And I think that um, it's something that will probably come back to haunt the United States. It's a little bit like Afghanistan did in, um, in after the, the war with the Soviet Union. Um, but I'm not very, I'm not very connected there. Um, you know, I've just got great friends there. I have, I have a family there. So I go back to see family and friends and editors, basically. Um, and, you know, it's nice going back and being able to communicate with everybody. Because I'm used to being in places where I generally can't communicate <laughs> with everybody. Um, I'm fr I grew up in upstate New York, <coughs> and my family's spread out all over the place. So I have family in upstate New York and New Mexico and California. Are we allowed one more question? Does anyone have a burning question? Mm. I have not read the Quran. I'm very familiar with passages from it, but I have not read them. No, no, <laughs> no. But I am there. I am a, um, I, you know, I'm a sort of acquainted with the the tenets of Islam. So, um, in terms of relate, like engaging, engaging. Sure. I mean, I think um, you know, people want to feel respected, and they want to feel that. Um, you know, they do have an understanding of their culture. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the fundamentals of Islam I've become acquainted with. Yeah. Thank you. Great.